Well, good morning, everybody. Um, a huge disclaimer, as, um, as I was introduced, I am not a tea researcher. Um, I'm actually a plant breeder. I'm working on a cereal crop called sorghum, which is a very drought-tolerant cereal crop, the fifth most important cereal crop in the world. Um, also, I've been asked to tell you that there will be raisins out in the break. <laughs> Those raisins are from our center. They're a new type of raisin called dry on the vine. These actually dry on the vine. You don't cut them. And so, um, as we've talked during the day, and as we will talk during the day, uh, labor is going to be a question about the success of a, any kind of small farm program like this, and we are running into labor pro, uh, problems in the valley. And so these dry on the vine raisins are an attempt to uh, get to a, a mechanization of raisin production in the valley. So it's something I think we'll need to think about uh, in tea as well. Um, I am not UC Davis, just so you know. <laughs> uh, Catherine, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm part of the division of the Ag and Natural Resources within the UC system, and that is a little bit different. We are kind of the umbrella group for the land grant system here in California. Uh, Believe it or not, UC Berkeley was the first land grant in the state. That's kind of hard to believe. Um, and then uh, UC Davis became part of that system as well as uh, UC Riverside. So we are kind of a conglomerate of the, uh, several of the universities within this system. Uh, we are located in Parlier, which is just south of Fresno, on about 330 acres. And I'm one of nine directors throughout the state, so we do have research centers um, all the way from Inner Mountain and the border with Oregon all the way down into a desert, which is borders uh, Mexico. So we cover the whole state um, in terms of our ability to perform research activities. Um, the history of our center was we were dedicated in uh, 1965 we currently do about 100 research projects. So tea is just one of 49 different crops that we grow on the center. That makes us very unique because if you go to other research and extension centers around the country, you're dealing with corn, soybeans, cotton, and a few other crops, and that's usually about it. Well, you know, we are just a, a small part of the diversity of what's grown in the state of California. I do have academics from both UC Riverside, Berkeley, and Davis on the center, and that's unique among the system. Um, and we, we do somewhere around 200 meetings a year, see about 6,000 people come through the center. So it's a fairly active research center. I wanted to give you a little bit of a personal history um, um, about tea, because you're asking, why is a sorghum guy working on tea, right? Um, my mom worked for United Airlines for 35 years, and so that gave us the ability to travel around the world. And um, my first real dealings with any kind of tea ceremony was in Japan when I was 14. Uh, when I was 14, I was six feet tall. Um, my dad and I were looked up to quite a bit in Japan because we were kind of an anomaly. Um, but we did go to a tea uh, ceremony in Japan. And, you know, as a 14-year-old boy, you're kind of thinking, wow, gee, thanks, Mom and Dad, for dragging me into this thing. But it was actually started uh, an interesting discovery of tea for me. Um, then I got on an airplane flight. When I was 17, I uh, was going back to visit some friends in London, and I was on the direct flight from Seattle to, um, to Heathrow, and uh, unfortunately got a very, 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 very bad um, coffee experience. And that completely turned me off of coffee. I got to England and I thought, holy smokes, what am I going to drink? And lo and behold, here's tea in London, right? So um, I really started to begin to appreciate tea a little bit more, um, primarily because I just couldn't take the taste of coffee anymore. Uh, from that experience on the airplane. So I came home, got my degrees, um, actually uh, became a Peace Corps volunteer in West Africa, and one of the people that I worked with was a Touareg. Now, if you know anything about Africa, Touaregs were the nomadic 
uh, traders that moved across the Sahara Desert, moving salt and then other goods back and forth across the Sahara. And I became really good friends with this Tuareg um, uh, colleague of mine. And we would do a Tuareg tea ceremony. And if you've ever had that, it's a real experience. This is a very, 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 very small uh, uh, brew cup of green tea with 15 cubes of sugar in the first brew, 12 in the second, and eight in the th third. The first is to family, the second is to health, and by the third, I'm not really quite sure what that was for. <laughs> but um, this was a very, very routine um, thing that Tuaregs do, especially as they travel across the desert, and they would do this three or four times a day. Uh, so again, my experience with tea uh, grew a little bit more as well. And then um, I came home to the United States um, and started looking for tea. And believe it or not, back in the 80s, it was hard to find loose leaf tea in the United States. I was one of the lucky few PhDs that when I finished my PhD, I actually had a job. I didn't have to go through the postdoc um, arena. I actually worked for the USDA as a curator for sorghum in Puerto Rico. And as you can imagine, loose leaf tea is not a very high selling thing in Puerto Rico. So I started looking over the internet and found actually the tea source. I'm not promoting any tea group, but I've been buying from them since about 15, 16 years ago because it was one of the few places I could find loose leaf tea, especially in Puerto Rico. Then I moved to Lubbock, Texas, and you can imagine the Panhandle of Texas, which is known for beef and not tea, is another difficult place to find tea. So um, I've had a long experience with tea. I show up at Kearney in 2011, and I asked what one of the bushes was out in the back, and they said, oh, I, we think that's tea. And I just kind of laughed that off. And then I got a phone call. And um, Jackie called and said, hey, do you know anything about tea? And I thought, well, I think we grew tea here back um, in the 1970s. Let me get back to you. And from that, and then meeting with Catherine was how we really got started on this thing about tea at Kearney. So it's been a long and uh, strange trip, I think. <laughs> so you are looking at some of the remnants of the tea that was grown at the center, um, essentially starting about the late 60s into the early 70s. Um, This is, I'm not really quite sure if this is the true history behind this, but it was my understanding that Lipton had approached Davis to grow tea, see, number one, if we could grow tea in California. And the story I heard, so this makes a really good story, was that Lipton was concerned about their black tea source, right? All the problems in Asia and the difficulty of getting tea out of Asia. So this tea program gets established at Kearney of all places, and so this tea program really gets off the ground and starts running. Then there's a guy named Richard Nixon who goes to China and probably drank a little too much sorghum wine. I can tell you all about sorghum wine if you're interested. And we have an open door policy, right, with China. Lipton supposedly calls Davis and says, we're not interested in research anymore, close down the program, and that's essentially what I heard happened. Well, it turns out that the guys that were working on this tea project wanted to preserve a little bit of the tea, so they just took a, two of the cultivars that they thought were the best out of the research program, and they planted them on the center. So these teas have been here since the 70s. And what we did was every once in a while when they got a little too big or a little too bushy, somebody would go through and cut them back like crazy, probably like what you do on roses. We'd throw a little bit of fertilizer on the ground, maybe get watered. Um, and so after 50 years, these things tend to, are, are actually still, it's amazing that they're still alive after the treatment we put them through. Um, so one of the first records that we could find about tea was uh, in the Fresno Bee. And this is a article, three major ifs will determine tea as another crop in California from 1968. So um, tea's not new to California. It's, it's, you know, there's been a little bit of a history of it in California. 
Um, and then a person named uh, Fry began leading the efforts, and we had tea planted uh, on April 28th, 29th, and May 13th and 26th in 1964. And so this is one of the handwritten notes um, that we found in some of our archival uh, notes in our not well-preserved library <laughs> um, that really kind of started this, this idea and interest in tea back at Kearney. We did have a, a, the first yield reports in the 70s, a one-page report in 71 and various reports in 72 to 78. Um, I don't know a lot about tea production, but actually I think these, the production looks actually pretty decent. Um, but, you know, the folks in this room will tell me, wow, that's terrible production or, wow, that's fabulous production. I don't really know. And I think this is one of the real challenges is we're kind of starting back from ground zero again on uh, research and extension of teas. Um, we actually had somebody do an economic analysis, um, and so we do have some of these reports that we've made available to the GTI. Uh, I talked with the Davis Library. They will um, be putting all those reports online so that people will be able to get in there and actually take a look at some of this early work that was done. Uh, I just wanted to show you a highlight of the 1978 report um, this was the yields of green leaf uh, pounds per acre. Uh, so again, I'm not a tea person. If I saw sorghum yields like that, I'd be pretty happy. So um, I'm not really sure if that's average tea production or if that's pretty decent tea production. But I can tell you, um, you know, the, the San Joaquin Valley is, can be a very difficult place to grow things because of the heat and the fact that we don't have very much water over the winter. Um, and so I, I think what I'm tr just trying to tell you is I think even back in the 70s, uh, we were able to actually produce some pretty high quality tea um, yields. So what happened to tea research? Like I said, Lipton decides that they no longer need to do tea. Um, they kind of stopped the whole program. And 1978 is the last time we, I could find a report about tea research on Kearney. So uh, it seems to have just kind of fallen off the face of the earth after uh, 1978. So there's been a little bit of stuff done in the UC system over the years, stuff that Mark has been doing for sure. Uh, but I, get, I, I believe we're really kind of at the, the foundation again. We're having to rebuild from the uh, foundation that we started back in the early or late 60s, early 70s and we'll have to rebuild on that foundation that we did start again. Uh, why could tea work in the San Joaquin Valley? And I want to give you um, um, uh, one of the reasons I think it could work is because of a thing called blueberries and the experience that we've had at Kearney with blueberries. So I think we could use the blueberry model as a model for tea production, cultivation, and small farms things. I think it's a valuable um, model to follow. Uh, Manuel Jimenez and other small farm advisors asked, why don't we grow blueberries in California? And this was the response he got. Laughter. You can't grow blueberries in California. Har har, good luck. And I think this is a kind of the experience that we're having now when we talk about doing tea in California. We kind of get this little chuckle, oh, that's cute. Uh, you probably can't do it. Um, and so, you know, Manuel got the same things I think that we're getting. It's too hot, it's not cold enough, it's too dry, there's no humidity, the soils aren't right, blueberries don't grow in California, we're getting the same thing, you could cross out blueberries and say, tea doesn't grow really well in California. It's the same experience that Manuel had about 20 years ago. So he began these observation trials and um, looked at what we could grow here in California in 1997. Believe it or not, in 1997, we had 196 acres in the state. Um, so blueberries obviously weren't a very big crop in the state at the, at the time. I think similar to what we're experiencing now with tea. Not a lot of acres, not a lot of research. Um, a lot of people just kind of chuckling at, oh, this is California, just growing another crop. Um, 
Over the next 20 years of research, he really began to uh, ask, why can't we grow blueberries? So what Manuel did, and exactly what Mark was starting, he reached out, tried to start bringing in some different cultivars. In the case of blueberries, that was out of a program in uh, the southeast that was actually breeding blueberries. He got a bunch of cultivars, he put them out in the ground in the San Joaquin and said, how come they don't grow? And believe it or not, they look terrible, except two plants. He started to do a little research of why these two plants seemed to be doing okay. And we had a very, very hot spot, hot pH spot in where those two plants were. So he determined that blueberries need acid soils. Oh, am I going the wrong way? Yeah, need acid soils. And found that southern high bush blueberries, which require less chilling hours, do pretty well and pruning, mulching, irrigation, and other ag agronomic practices really need to be developed in order to push blueberries along. Well, the nice thing about California is that um, you can do certain things to amend the soil and lower the pH, and Manuel started to do this, and we went from essentially not very much uh, blueberry production to really some pretty high-yielding blueberry cultivars um, that do really well here in California. And that's just showing you some of the uh, research activities that went along in care at Kearney to do that. Um, he lowered the pH. He started mulching. He started doing different irrigation technologies. And I uh, think this is the same kind of process that we're going to go through down at Kearney and other research centers to really understand how well we can grow tea here in California. I just wanted to show you this, what have, what have blueberries done? Remember when I told you um, that in 1997 there was 196 acres of blueberries? Um, we are now currently, this is 2015, the last number I saw we were approaching 10,000 acres in the state. Um, but more importantly, look at the yields. And this has been a real problem because the only blueberry breeding programs in the country have, are out in the southeast. And the southeast is very reluctant to send us now new cultivars of blueberries <laughs> because you'll notice most of the yields in the southeast are not all that great. The story I hear is that if you hit 2,500 pounds in the Carolinas or Georgias or in Michigan, you think you've hit it out of the ballpark. Um, the farmers in the San Joaquin Valley now are routinely doing six to 10,000 pounds per acre. And so now um, we really need a blueberry breeder in California uh, to really develop different cultivars for the state. But you can see that, you know, from going from nowhere 20 years ago to, you know, not huge acres, but significant growth in acres, it's really the, the, uh, our ability to produce really high-yielding blueberries. And I really believe this is the same kind of model that we can see in tea as well. So why tea might work? I think blueberries really offer a really good model from which research on tea can build. Um, we have, I believe, some similarities with blueberries, um, soil pH being one of them. Um, I, I'm not quite sure about the shading, but as I understand it, tea, some teas require lots of shading. Uh, so do blueberries. Um, it's a very high value uh, crop and has a high value market potential. Um, it has excellent nutritional and health properties. As you know, blueberries are one of the standards in the health industry for antioxidants. I think tea would be right there with them, if not higher. Um, and it was done 39 years ago at our center. So I think we have some really interesting possibilities with kind of restarting our research here um, in the UC system on tea and really expanding our current knowledge about tea production in the state of California. Um, we do have tremendous research opportunities. When the tea was grown at Kearney, my understanding was that it was a combination of flood irrigation and sprinkler irrigation because those were the dominant irrigation strategies back in the 70s. We've come a long, long way from flood irrigation and sprinkler irrigation since then. So um, like blueberries, like many of our crops that we grow in the valley, we have transitioned from flood irrigation to a lot of drip irrigation. 
drip irrigation offers uh, incredible opportunities to control, I believe, the quality through timing of irrigation applications. Talking with Jackie, who's speaking next, you know, Jackie has indicated that uh, there seems to be fluctuations in the quality of the tea um, based on stress. And so if you think about California, we are a Mediterranean climate. We don't get any rain in the summer. It's a great place to study drought tolerance because of that, because I can turn the water off and create stress essentially any time during the summer that I want. So I think uh, through research, working with Jackie and the chemistry behind what's happening in the plant, and really doing timely applications, we be, may be able to manipulate the tea in the field to produce some really high quality tea um, through irrigation strategies. Um, we probably need some work on water use efficiency research on, on the crop. Um, I don't know of a lot of that that happens, but that would help us identify critical times for growth um, in the crop. There are obviously drought and salinity questions. Um, one of the problems with drip irrigation <clears throat> is if you have poor quality water, little salty water, you can build up salts in the soil pretty quickly. So drought and salinity issues may be a problem in California long term that we'll have to look at. And we do have unique research facilities at our centers to do that. Our West Side Research and Extension Center actually can produce different degrees of salinity in um, soil in the field. And so we have some different things that we can try to look at salinity questions. Um, can tea be mechanized and not lose the quality? I think that's a huge question for California if tea production on a large scale is to happen. Again, because the reason I brought the raisins, I don't know how, uh, if you all know how raisins are produced, but typically in my neck of the woods, when raisins are uh, being uh, harvested, you need 30 to 40,000 people to show up in Selma and Parlier um, over a three-week period to go harvest the grapes, put them on the ground, on paper trays to let them dry, then come back and pick them up after a couple of weeks of drying. Um, so, uh, you know, there's this whole issue of trying to find 30 or 40,000 people. This could be a problem in tea production, so we need to determine whether or not we can find mechanical ways to do this and retain the quality. Um, there's processing questions. One of the great things about Kearney is we do have a post-harvest facility at Kearney, so we do a lot of post-harvest research at the site, so we already have the buildings in place to develop and build on processing. So I think it's a good place to actually do some of the processing questions that we may have. And working with Jackie, really working on the nutritional uh, questions that, that T offers. So I think there's really tremendous research opportunities. Again, I've already talked to several of the other research directors in the state, and a couple of them have shown interest in growing tea in different parts of the state on the research centers. So I think um, we can really start rebuilding our research and scientific knowledge about growing tea in California. Why I'm uh, excited, I think because it provides a new opportunity for small uh, uh, farmers. Um, like Mark said, California is unique in the country because it's one of the few places you can still potentially remain a small farmer. Um, it, it, it's really hard to do in Iowa, right, or the Midwest, or the Corn Belt or even the Southeast. So I think California really does offer this unique opportunity to become a, a, a profitable small farmer. Um, as we've all seen, there's tremendous growth in the uh, uh, drink market, especially for specialty teas. Five years ago, you would have never found a tea shop in Fresno, California, right? <laughs> um, it showed up five years ago, and it's still in business. Um, you know, th that I think shows the interest in tea, even in Fresno. Um, you know, we, we've um, complained that we're not that sophisticated. You know, we, we, we don't get the press that Hollywood and San Francisco or Silicon Valley does, but there are actually some really unique things about Fresno. The fact that we grow about 50% of all the fruits and vegetables for the country, you know, a few little things like that. 
Um, and the interesting thing, and I think one of the things that maybe turned Lipton off a little bit about the tea being grown at Kearney was they found that we could grow really good oolongs at Kearney. And I believe at the time Lipton wasn't really interested in oolong teas. They were interested in black teas to put in their, their bags. And so I think in some cases, um, you know, we, we have this opportunity to grow really good high quality teas. Um, and I believe um, because of our partnerships with UC, with uh, the Global Tea Initiative, we can uh, build really strong worldwide partnerships and collaborations. I'm really excited about that. Um, you know, like many of us in this room with gray hair, you know, we're getting close to thinking about retirement, and I, I'm really looking forward to establishing this facility and getting this off the ground so I can leave a legacy, right, to the new uh, group of researchers that come on and really get involved in something that I'm really passionate about, which is tea. Um, I'm very passionate about a couple things. My wife, <laughs> sorghum, <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> and tea. So um, it's kind of a weird combination, you know. I've been accused of being a little strange myself, but um, I, you know, I, I think this really offers a, a unique opportunity to uh, rebuild this tremendous knowledge base that we started in California back in the 70s. So with that, um, I know we have a little bit of time, and yeah, we're going to hold off. Question. One question. <laughs> What's my favorite tea? Uh, you know, I'm still developing my palate. I really like oolongs, right? Um, but I, I think this is in many ways, I'm probably very similar to um, uh, the, the wine folks, right? Um, in Texas, it's very difficult to get good wine, right? Puerto Rico, it's almost impossible to find good wine. I come back home to California. I'm originally from California. I was born in San Francisco, raised in the Bay Area. Um, and I've found that it just takes a while to develop your palate. And that's what I'm doing. I'm exploring lots of different teas. Some pretty questionable. Others are really, really nice. Okay, we have a question back. Yeah. So, sir, um, as a well, tea person, I, I want to make a few comments. Uh, one is that tea is a very, very versatile plant that grows from Japan, all the way here, from Argentina, going up to Russia, and so on and so forth. So the, I, I don't see any difficulty. Of course, cost-wise, there will be a problem. But first and foremost, I want to, I want to, I'm very happy that tea landed in UC Davis. I want to, I want to thank you guys for taking it up and with the passion you are taking. So that is, uh, that is not a question, but I, uh, uh, appreciation of UC Davis and um, uh, so we are committed to support you guys. So the second point I want to make, which was very interesting from the, from the, it's not the volume of tea, actually there is overproduction of tea in the worldwide, so you can't just produce tea and uh, so the thing, the secret is to, uh, to be able to make High quality teas, high right. quality teas, so that it's especially from small small farm situations, so that you can sell at reasonably good prices. So the, the secret. So I was very uh, very the last part of your comment, and I don't know how you determine that you produce excellent oolongs. I, I'll be very interested to find out that further, because oolongs have been under appreciated in the U.S. It's a very nice tea. So, um, I, I, I don't want to know, maybe you can comment about the oolong appreciation, how you identified that uh, you got... Uh, well, you as I understand, what would happen is that the, the, the folks here would harvest the tea, put it on an airplane, ship it back to South Carolina for the folks in South Carolina to process. And from that, they would come back and say, hey, this is pretty good oolong tea. So I don't know how they were processing it, <laughs> no, no. right? That, that um, doesn't work. So it might be even questionable whether or not they even knew what they were talking about. <laughs> you know, I mean, South Carolina is home of sweet tea, right? I mean, so. so 
the one other point is uh, that uh, what Jackie had mentioned, uh, stress, stress really produces, from what I know, uh, very good teas during some stressful conditions uh, world over. Uh, the, the crops are less, but the flavor is really good. So I think uh, we might have, you, you, you all have some work cut out for you to, to work on those things and steer the small, steer the small farmers towards producing excellent quality versus, uh, uh, versus just mass production or just growing tea for the sake of growing right. tea and I think, the volumes. Right. Uh, I volumes. think our experience in the UC system, especially with irrigation and irrigation technologies, really um, offers a unique opportunity to study that. Um, with especially drip irrigation, we'll be able to actually control how much water and when we're putting the water down. And then working with groups like uh, Jackie and really looking at what happens to tea quality when you manipulate the irrigation um, of that tea, I think really offers a unique opportunity to produce some pretty interesting type of teas, just through some very simple management strategies. I mean, we control irrigation uh, on, on drip very um, routinely now. Um, uh, much of it is now controlled by this little thing, you know, that we call, you know, our, our life right now, right? So I can get on my phone and I can turn on or off my irrigation from here, even though I may be down in the valley. Um, so I think there's some really kind of unique research opportunities to really play on that. Thank you for your appreciation for tea.